Hello. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us at our opening ceremony for the Social Genocide Exhibition. My name is Karima Ahn, and I have the great honor of being today's pre presenter. Today, we are here to commemorate those who have been persecuted, tortured, killed at the hands of the Erdogan regime, and who have been stripped of all of their rights with no redress. We are here to stand in solidarity for the tens and thousands of people, including journalists, academics, judges, and politicians and doctors who have been imprisoned on false terrorism charges. We gather here to remember the lives lost on the treacherous journey to freedom, including that of Hatija Akchabai and her three children who drowned in the freezing waters of the Maritza River as they tried to reach Greece. We are here to provide a glimmer of hope to the victims and their families who anxiously await for the day justice will be served. Consider these artifacts as more than just tangible objects as you explore this exhibit. Rather, think of them as the closest witnesses to the atrocities of Turkey's <coughs> continuing genocide. While some of them bear the agony of those still imprisoned, other carry the souls of those who have passed away. While they physically cannot be here to tell their own stories, their pain will echo throughout this exhibit thanks to all of our dedicated volunteers who have worked diligently to bring this to life. As you explore the exhibit, please feel free to share your thoughts through the hashtag Unmute Voices of Turkey. I now have the pleasure of inviting the Executive Director of AST and Migration Scholar, Ms. Hafsa Girdap, to share her opening speech for this evening. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone. And um, I have to say that no words can describe our appreciation uh, about your presence today to support us, to support the um, persecuted people in Turkey. So as the executive director of AST, I would like to share our work with you. As, uh, AST Advocates of Silence Turkey was established in 2017 after the uh, coup attempt just, you know, swept the rule of law away in Turkey. And we, as, as, as a, in our organization, we write reports, submit them to the international organizations, we organize conferences, we organize panels, we write academic papers, and we visit relevant offices too. Uh, in, 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 in addition to these, you know, very technical uh, work, we also uh, organize such art exhibitions or such real-life true stories exhibitions because, you know, as humans, uh, I'm a teacher in, at the university and uh, I, I'm teaching migration and gender. And when I am teaching, I, I always tell my students that, okay, we are talking about humans. Of course, they are facts and figures. In, we also talk about statistical data, but we are talking about real life stories, true life experiences. So we have to be aware of this. This exhibition actually does this work you know, very effectively because you're gonna see the uh, real objects of real people who have been um, subjected to harsh violations and persecution in Turkey. And, um, why this exhibit? I would like to uh, also tell uh, the two concrete examples that you'll see their stories while you're walking around the exhibit. Emine Şen Yaşar, she's a Kurdish woman, and uh, her two sons and her husband, uh, they were just killed uh, in an attack which was conducted by uh, political figures who were affiliated with the current administration. She's I mean, she did seek for justice for her sons, for her husband, but all the doors were shut down in her face. Now she's sitting in front of the local court for more than 500 days. This is the you know, case of the rule of law in Turkey right now. Another, uh, another true life that you are going to see again, you are going to witness, Bahadur, he's a young boy. He was a young boy and a uh, 16-year-old teenager. And his father was dismissed and persecuted and jailed. And as a teenager, uh, he couldn't handle this pressure that he faced and he committed suicide. And Bahadur, 
unfortunately, is among the over a hundred people who committed suicide during this purge, just uh, since 2016 failed coup attempt. So again, uh, wrapping up, I want to remind the social media campaign that uh, Kerme just mentioned, please support uh, this exhibition and raise awareness about it, uh, posting your thoughts, feelings, using the hashtag Unmute the Voices of Turkey. And again, uh, I would like to welcome you. Thank you for caring human rights and humanity for those even beyond your borders. Thank you, Ms. Hafsa, for those remarks. I'd like to now welcome Ms. Aslahan Kash, coordinator of the Social Genocide Exhibition and ASD board me member to offer her thoughts. Everything starts with a little seed. The first seeds of our Social Genocide Exhibition were planted on February 24, 2022 in our commemoration for the persecuted lives in Turkey and art exhibition. The artwork created by unjustly imprisoned individuals and those who face civilian death in Turkey, such as calligraphies, marbling, and bracelets made from olive seeds were important remind reminders of the need for a genocide exhibition. These memories were brought to the United States and serve as, as a significant milestone for the exhibition, which I am honored to coordinate. With months of dedication and effort, the Social Genocide Exhibition is now touring to the United States, allowing more people to meet these stories. Also tonight, I am pleased to give you the great news that our book about the exhibition was published today on Google Books. The social, genocide, the social Genocide Exhibition was first held in New Jersey on June 5, 2022. Later, our American ASC advisory board member, Kerry Orke, and her friends hosted it in three different locations in Kansas City on September 21st and met with thousands of people. Now, we are with you in Washington, D.C., kindly hosted by Rumi Forum. People's belongings are the most vivid witnesses of the pain experienced. So, during the preparations, we made a list of what items we could ask from whom. Right after, we tried to reach the victims, some of whom had passed away and suffered from civil death. We contacted many symbolic names from social media and their relatives. We told many mourning families, we will announce the genocide experienced by your loved ones throughout America, and we will share it with the world. 95% of the people we interviewed gave us a positive answer, and we will remain grateful to them forever. Those people trusted us and agreed to send those priceless memories thousands of miles away. When we received the relics, we took great care of them with the awareness that people sent them as if they were sending their hearts and hopes to us. First, we gathered the relics and their stories and our friends housed in Turkey in different cities. Then, shipments started and we spent days and nights praying for them to arrive to us safely. In this exhibition, we brought together hundreds of memories of persecuted and marginalized people of all ethnic identities, beliefs, and ideological views, especially Kurds, Alevis, members of the Hizmet movement, women, children, journalists, politicians, and activists. I want to honor and reminisce a few people and the tragic events they experienced. I was most impressed by that beautiful local dress, scarf, and socks belonging to the Tibet Anna. Tibet Inan was an innocent Kurd mother who was killed with 10 bullets by the security forces in the middle of the street in Silopi, and whose body was left on the road 
for seven days due to, to the curfew. I felt her pain and nobility deep in my soul. After the exhibition, her son said, our pain will not end, but thank you very much for announcing my mother's name to the world. We realized that our efforts were worth everything. The feedback from families motivated us the most. We aim to keep their stories alive with one item each. What brings us together? Here is neither our religion, race, nor worldview. Instead, what brings us together is kindness and love. Only the seeds of kindness and understanding will grow into redeemers of the world. In the social genocide exhibition, we aim to listen to the voice of people of all colors and tell their stories to the world. From Mahsa Amini, who lost her life because she did not want to wear a headscarf in Iran. To Muslims from East Turkestan, who are still subjected to various torture and persecution. To children from Afghanistan, whose education rights were denied to innocent people who are subjected to war in Ukraine, and to, and to those under dictatorships anywhere in the world. We aim to be the voice of all people whose rights have been violated. Together with my team, we will continue to work a world that respects human values and rights. Before I end my words, I would like to give my thanks to the unnamed heroes who bravely took responsibility in safely sending these memories to us, even at the risk of being arrested. To Mr. Barış, a human rights activist who contacted our sisters and brothers who suffered just because they are Kurds. To Melek Çetinkaya, the spiritual mother and activist of the innocent imprisoned military students and who carried out hundreds of street protests for them alone. To Natalie Avazian, an Armenian Christian who has been a mother to many innocent children like Yusuf Kerim Sayan and Ahmet Burhan Atac, and who has voiced the injustice so many have experienced. To Abdullah Demirbaş, an exiled politician awarded by Harvard University and punished by the Turkish government for serving in the Kurdish, Armenian, Zazaki, Arabic, and Syriac languages during his mayoral period. To Mr. Omer Faruk Gergerlioğlu, the representative of those who relentlessly stayed by the victims, regardless of their identity, belief, and race. To our American friend Kerry Orke and her friends who organized and hosted this exhibition in Kansas City, preserved these memories as holy relics in their own church and made it possible for nearly 1,000 Americans to see this exhibition. And to all AST volunteers in New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and Kansas City. Last but not least, I would like to express my endless thanks to Rumi Forum for hosting this program and to you all for coming here to support us. Thank you. Thank you, Aslan. I will now invite Annette Lantos Tillman Dick to share her remarks. She is the chairman of the advisory board of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights, secretary of the Interfaith Forum of the G20, and the host of a podcast called Women Read Scripture. Well, I am very honored to be in your midst today, and I, I feel what I felt when I first met the members of Hizmet when I went to Turkey, and that was an incredible spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. There is no way I felt anything but that we were one family, and that we were serving one God, and we did it with a kind of deep dedication and a desire to be that service in our lives. And I cannot express the horror and grief that I have felt over the last years as I've seen the 
endless persecution, the in unspeakable injustice that has permeated that nation that unfortunately is extremely important strategically to the free world, which um, in some ways makes it harder for our leaders to deal with these situations as they should, which is to not tolerate it in any way. Um, I was quite moved over the course of time to see how, whether they're Kurds, whether members of Hizmet, whether other persecuted Turks, you have, my experience has been that people have not had the same, I have been filled with actual venom constantly when I think of the leaders of Turkey and the leader who has perverted this nation, who has appealed to the lowest in his people rather than the highest of which there is much. It has, it has made my blood run cold. And what I've seen in those who have suffered these persecutions, those who are, are seeking to support them, is long suffering, energy, love, sacrifice, devotion, and now, hopefully, in Turkey, an incredible coming together of these disparate elements in Turkish society who had many reasons not to come together, but have overcome that and perhaps, if there is any justice in the world, will now be able to turn the tide in that nation. It will never bring back those who have died and, the, and it will never undo the enormous suffering and injustice that has been done. People may know, I don't know, but my, we are human rights, um, Foundation, the Lantos Foundation, was organized upon the death of my late father, Tom Lantos, who was the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the United States Congress. And when he, when my father went to Congress, the thing that was most important to him was to create a mechanism for advocating for human rights in Congress. As you can imagine, he saw much suffering. Most of his family were killed in the Holocaust and miraculously he survived and my mother survived. They were not married at the time but they'd known each other as young children and they were able, in different ways they, they survived this huge inferno and um, were able to come to the United States and, and my father amazingly at the age of 50 was elected to serve in the United States Congress. And today the um, Human Rights Commission, he organized originally with a, a Republican colleague, the Human Rights Caucus. In Congress, you need one Democrat and one Republican who will agree to contribute some of their budget if there is a worthy um, cause, and then they can form what's called a caucus. And my father and a, a, a distinguished colleague on the Republican side formed the Human Rights Caucus. And when my dad died, it was made into a commission, which is wonderful because that's a permanent standing part of the United States Congress, and it is a place where people with human rights issues can go and be heard by Congress. So this is, human rights are a cause that have been very dear to our heart. Um, the reality of it in Turkey was, of course, staggeringly dis um, disappointing is the wrong word, devastating, devastating is the only word I think one can use. I am so grateful that you are all here together. I'm so grateful to hear these beautiful talks that manifest the kind of brotherhood that I felt the very first time I was introduced to members of Hizmet. And I am grateful to, I was, I want to say one thing that was important to me when I, as this crisis evolved and deepened, I was moved to see that the members of Hizmet that I met were not breathing fire as I felt I would be. They were rather humble. They were heartbroken. And they were conscious of ways that they would grow spiritually through this devastating experience. What greater testament to the quality of human beings? and Though some of them, some of you have died and many have suffered and much has been taken, 
we know that this is just a part of what we're doing here on Earth. And there is no doubt in my mind that <coughs> glorious, glorious rewards and possibilities will await all of these faithful people as they move forward maybe in their eternal path as well. But we hope, and I am praying and fast, fasting, that this election will actually be able to come to pass. That we will see that instead of being silenced, Turkey, you will be able to be articulate and fully outspoken Turkey and changing the ways that things are done in your country and helping others to learn to do them in, with the love and the kindness and the care that you have, have manifest. I, I do want to say that I also am grateful to see the Kurdish part of Turkey uniting with Hizmet and with others, with secular Turks as well, to afford this change. And I hope that, the, that in the new Turkey that will emerge from this, we will see a Turkey where Kurds are respected and honored, where Hizmet is respected and honored, where people can live together, diverse, and loving and appreciating the good in one another. And I am looking forward to this beautiful exhibit, and I really commend you for the effort <coughs> and love and sacrifice that went into sharing the message like this. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, for those meaningful remarks. Rabbi Bruce Aft is an adjunct professor at George Mason University and Rabbi Emeritus at Congregation Adat Ram. He will be sharing his thoughts this evening. Please welcome him. When I was invited to be able to be here tonight, I uh, was honored uh, to be able to be part of this. You know, as I saw inside and out some of the individual and personal stories which are told, I couldn't help but remember when I was standing by a uh, sort of, a, I don't know what exactly to call it, a, uh, a glass case where they were exhibiting suitcases that had been brought by victims into Auschwitz. And we were looking at those suitcases and they had names on them because people thought, you know, they didn't want them to be lost. And all of a sudden there was a shriek and we all ran to the student who was shrieking and she said, that suitcase was my grandfather's suitcase. And the personal stories which are told by the relics, the clothes, the ties, the things that you'll see that are, on a, that are being exhibited, they tell a personal story. Your presence here tells a personal story of resilience and resistance. A previous speaker spoke about the importance of gathering together in kindness. Well, when that young teenage student saw her great-grandfather's grandfather's suitcase with the name Kafka on it, not the famous Kafka, it was a common name, and the way that people reached out, I wish that we could reach out to you, so many who have family members who are suffering, who have suffered, who may not be alive anymore, so many of you who live with uncertainty every day, wondering where this is going to end. So I wanted to be here because for a number of reasons. One is that we are taught, I think it was by either Elie Wiesel or Martin Luther King. They spoke very similarly and at my advancing age, I sometimes don't remember who said what. But one of them said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And whoever said it, we need to remember it. I also am reminded of Pastor Martin Niemöller, a name that may be familiar to some of you, who was a Nazi sympathizer until they tried to quiet him, until they tried to mute him. And he said, you know, they 
came for the communists and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a Catholic. And then they came for me and there was no one left to stand up. So we do have to stand here together to make sure that we can stand up for each other. And finally, in Jewish scriptural teaching during a holiday that just went past a few weeks ago, the holiday of Passover, we say in every generation we have to remember that we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and we were strangers in a strange land. And when we see others who are suffering, we need to stand up and we need to be counted. And so let's hope that the story we share here tonight is one of action, one that will allow a gathering like this to take place in the not so distant future when we can be celebrating better times and celebrating those times in tribute to all who have been suffering. So thank you for the honor of being able to address you this evening. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bruce. Now, please give a warm welcome to Andrea Barron, the Advocacy and Outreach Program Manager at the Torture Abolition and Survivors Support Coalition. So, um, so I work with an organization, as she mentioned, has a long name, the Torture Abolition and Survivors Support Coalition. And we have a very modest goal, which is to abolish torture in the world, right? Very modest goal. Uh, and we provide direct services to survivors of torture in the greater Washington metropolitan area. And I saw also, I also train, I also train people in advocacy throughout the country. And um, thank you very much, Ibrahim, who invited me and the Rumi Forum. I've worked with Ibrahim on a lot of other kinds of forums, including interfaith action, Jewish Muslim collaboration, and happy to be here today. So I was so impressed by the title of this exhibit, uh, Unmuted, Silent Voices, Political Persecution in Turkey. My job is to make the voices of torture survivors loud instead of silent. So what I do is I train them, and these are mostly from Africa, from Ethiopia, Cameroon, Eritrea, other countries in Africa. How can we make those voices loud and people pay attention to them. So what I do is I train them to speak to members of Congress and congressional aides. And three of them testify at the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. So thank you very much. And um, they were tortured simply because they stood up for freedom and democracy. They came from mostly middle class families. They participated in an opposition political party. Um, a few, small number of them are from the LGBT community. And they have suffered unspeakable, unspeakable crimes of torture. And I'll just tell you one story um, from a man from Eritrea. So I visited Eritrea in 2018, and I remember going to a hotel, and I came out of the hotel uh, in Asmara, and the owner said to me, see that piece of land right there in front of you? Right under there could be a prison where people are kept underground and tortured right beneath your feet. And I will, ne I will never forget that experience. And so, you know, I'm so happy and my organization to be here with all of you to support the Hizmet movement, to have hopes, like Annette said, for the next election in Turkey, and also for exposing the horrendous human rights abuses and torture committed by the Turkish government. So I have been long aware that um, the quasi-dictator of Turkey was on his way to becoming a dictator. And I think what you're doing is you're showing the human cost of what dictatorship means. It's not just a word you read about, someone's a dictator. It has horrible, horrible human costs. And I saw, you know, some of the stories I read about, like Hosnan Jane, a victim of forced marriage, detained for singing in Kurdish when she was young, beaten, uh, stood up for women in Kurdish areas, the Yazidi women, and also for women everywhere. And, and then I read about Abdullah Demirbash, who had the courage to talk about and acknowledge 
uh, Armenia, an Armenian genocide. And I met another uh, member of Hizmat, not here tonight, a few weeks ago at a party in Howard County. He told me, yes, we acknowledge it was an Armenian genocide. And I said, oh my God, I've never heard anyone from Turkey say that. And what that made me do is, um, is uh, even admire all of you for not only standing up for yourselves and what you believe, but for people who are oppressed all over the world. And I want to close by talking about Figan Yuk Segda. I think I got that right. And the red scarf that was gifted to her. And she said that this red scarf stands for oppressed people everywhere. And it also stands for our torture survivors from Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for your remarks. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Mr. Budish, a leftist Kurdish volunteer who, despite the risk of getting arrested, played a profound role in helping AST acquire some of the belongings displayed here today. I want to share a few passages from a letter he sent to AST expressing his thoughts about this exhibit. Mr. Budish begins his Mr. Sorry, Mr. Budish begins by recounting the night he was on the brink of taking his own life, overcome by despair, and how a message from an AST member, whom he now regards to be no different than a sister, saved his life. The message read, hello, please be well, we need each other. These few heartfelt words changed the trajectory of Mr. Budish's life. Months later, his AST contact informed him that the organization was planning an exhibition that would feature a variety of personal artifacts to represent several persecuted populations, including the Kurds. They needed his help in getting in contact with the relatives of the Kurdish victims, mainly in southeastern Turkey. The prospect that people in a country across the world would learn of this genocide shocked Mr. Budish, as he expresses in his letter. He recounts the rush of emotions he experienced upon realizing that there were, in fact, people who heard the muffled cries of his, Tur of his Kurdish brothers and sisters, who cared about their stories, and who shared their pain. Motivated by this news, he was eager to help in any way necessary. Mr. Budish's recollection of his conversation with Jemile Chorga's father was one of the parts of his letter that left me shaken. Jemile was 11 years old when she was killed by a sniper while playing on the streets of Shirnak, Turkey. Her family, unable to transport her to the hospital or bury her bo body due to the state-mandated curfew, had to keep their daughter's body in the refrigerator for three long days. The first time I brought this matter to his attention, his vocal cords almost broke from crying, says Mr. Budish. Are you serious? Did others hear us crying out? Will those all the way in America really find out about what happened to my Jimile? Asked her father. I gulped and exclaimed, yes, we succeeded. We finally succeeded in being one. The value of this exhibition is unprecedented for those who, like Mr. Budish, risk their lives to gather these belongings, and the families of the victims who can find some solace in knowing that there are people who don't distinguish between Kurds, Turks, or Alevites, who are working relentless to share the, their loved one's stories with the world. Please now help me welcome the director of the American Kurdish Information Network, Mr. Kani Zulam, to share his remarks. Um, earlier, Aslihan and Hafsa were kind enough to show me some of the um, artifacts of the uh, tortured, tortured Turks and Kurds and killed Turks and Kurds. Uh, whatever I say is in, in, insufficient. Um, you really need Sophocles, Shakespeare, Tolstoy to capture the pain and the suffering 
of the Turks and Kurds that um, now live in Turkey. Uh, I have one short Kurdish story to tell you, one short American story to tell you, and a quote of an American president to part from you. The Kurdish story belongs to Mehdi Zana. Um, it has to do with the name of your exhibition, Unmuting Silenced Voices. He was a duly elected mayor of the largest Kurdish city in the Middle East, the Arakir. He got elected in 1997. In 1980, there was a military coup in Turkey, and he was uh, taken into custody and horribly tortured. Between 1980 and between 1994, close to 420 Turks, Kurds, were tortured to death in Turkish prisons. He survived. About eight months after his arrest and torture, he was told he could see his loved ones, and he was told, who did he want to see? He said he wanted to see his mother. They told him, fine, we'll send the word out. Your mom can come. The word was sent out. The mother was coming. He was taken to the visitation room with two guards holding his arms with batons in their hands. They told him there is no Kurdish language in Turkey or Kurdish language period. You have to talk to your mother in Turkish. Mehdi Zana knew his mother didn't speak Turkish. Mehdi Zana didn't want to disrespect his mother and speak to her in a language that she didn't understand. So he was brought to the room. He was behind the iron bars. His mom was in front of him. And his mom waited for him to say something. And he wasn't saying anything. If you're a believer, I believe he, she had an epiphany. She said, oh my god, they have muted and uh, they have made my son mute and deaf. He is unable to speak in Kurdish. The muting has been going on, not just since 2016, at least for the Kurds since 1923. Now the American story. Uh, it belongs to Chief Justice John Roberts. In 2017, his son, graduated from Cardigan Mountain School and Middle School. Chief Justice was invited to give the commencement speak, speech. It's on YouTube, you could watch it. I'll just briefly refer to it. He says um, he wished the students a lot of bad luck. He said, I hope you'll have pain in your lives because it will make you compassionate. None of you here um, don't know about pain. We all do. Uh, but when it's too much, we may lose track of our humanity. And I'd like to end by a quote from President Nixon. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Connie, for those powerful words. Please help me welcome the director. Apologies. Now I'd like to invite the co-host of this event and Rumi Forum's executive director, Mr. Ibrahim Amna. Thank you for uh, being here and for those fascinating remarks to which I don't have anything uh, meaningful to add from my repertoire of words, uh, which I can only echo. But fortunately, 
uh, sitting at Rumi Forum, I always have a quote from the great luminary to, to fulfill my role in these moments. And he reminds, uh, keep breaking your heart until it opens. So as a matter of fact, uh, Sufis, uh, Rumi and his contemporaries, or those who, are, who have been like him through the ages, had a very different calculation, as this quote uh, powerfully reminds us. And, uh, and truly so, this is the mood I feel here tonight, during this evening, uh, we are coming to this courtyard with, uh, with broken hearts, but they are more open uh, to, to embrace one another and to powerfully um, empathize with, with anyone in pain in any corner of the world. So thanks for being here to share this moment with us. I'd like to again thank Ms. Hafsa Girdab, Ms. Aslahan Kash, Mr. Ibrahim Anla, our lovely speakers, and all of those who worked tirelessly to make this exhibit possible. Finally, let me leave you with these powerful words from Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Today is the day we stand in solidarity with all of those who have been persecuted at the hands of a tyrant. Let's stand on the right side of, side of history. Thank you. Uh, also, if I could have our uh, speakers uh, up here to take a group picture, that would be appreciated. Thank you. What a beautiful job. <laughs> I try.